All right. We're here today with Mr. John Andrew Frederick. How are you doing today, John? I'm doing great, Mr. Southpaw. <laughs> How are you? I'm doing all right, thank you. All right. Nice to see you again. You as well. You were my first repeat guest. How does that feel? I feel terribly honored. Obviously, that's uh, something of a prompt, and it's the same. And at the same time, it is a prodigious honor to be uh, back. I loved your questions from last time, and I even remember most of them. So <laughs> let's try and not repeat ourselves and bore bore your fans. Mine, I don't. Mine, I can. You know, I can go ahead and manage to. To, to tire them out of touch but yeah let's not bore your fans i i think we'll be all right though i mean it, it is tempting to just ask you all the same questions <laughs> well that'd be hilarious <laughs> i take it you still haven't I'm watched i sure uh... have a different a different you know and um disingenuous answer for for them somehow because i don't know what it is about you sir but you inspire a kind a kind of uh um, flippancy, a, a benign flippancy. Let's put it like that. I like that. Yeah. Benign flippancy. I take yeah. it you still haven't watched the Pretty Woman video uh, movie. Um, I don't that know that list. I have. <laughs> all right. Well, actually, I, I have all new questions. So, I'll, oh, brilliant. I'll, let's go with okay. those. I noticed on the opening track of your new record that the chorus is, ooh, etc. And I mean, I, I like you know, the idea of you sending me secret messages through your songs, but I was planning <laughs> on having you back anyway. I just want to rest, you know, rest your mind I, there. I think you're, I think you could be, you could have the dubious distinction of being our first um, conspiracy theorists. Yes, my vo yes, I was trying to be the voice in your head, young, uh, you know, uh, just you've caught me out on that one. Absolutely. Spookily it works because here we are. Yeah, Ju Julie Schulte, who sang on the record and on Brilliant Failures, the last one that came out, um, she she saw uh, I was I was I was you know fancying her singing on the the next record as well, and um I showed her the lyrics and we did some rehearsing, and um she she saw that I had written E T C there and she kind of she sang it out herself because that wasn't the original intention. It was meant to be a kind of a a bra in brackets filler sort of thing and um she thought gosh you know and she's a she's a pop boffin too she knows way more music than you, you would ever expect anybody to do to do but um but she she said you know sing that out sing out etc i don't know that anybody's done that in a pop song yeah. um, like somehow it. so it turned it turned out great yeah, it was a bold, a bold move to send you a message too. And yes, you've twigged that. Yeah, it's. I was trying to beckon you to get me on the show again. Here we are. And it worked. Yeah. And it worked indeed. Oh, I love that. Like a happy little accident of you know, it not being. I what mean, it's supposed to be. most of the mo, you know, most of the songs I consider something like happy accidents. You know, I took up painting about 10 years ago, not being able to draw a stick man, but having a, or woman, let's not, you know, le lest we be less than politically correct <laughs> to draw a stick woman, but you might get yourself in hot water talking about that. Like he considers them just twigs, not just twiggy. Um, but I, when I started painting, I thought, you know, all I have is a yen to do something that's not um, you know, necessarily for recognition's sake, like everything else, it seems that I do. And I can't, I, my, the nuns at, at the mission in Santa Barbara used to put D pluses on my um, et etchings and things when I was 10 years old. So I still put a D plus on every painting that I do. But I found that, you know, if you just fall in love deeply enough with Cy Twombly, for, ex for, for example, you know, and you, and you uh, scrape around and, um, toss and turn with a paintbrush or a pen in your hand, you know, things will emerge. Happy accidents will, will occur somehow. And, you know, it's great that you can erase things just like when you're writing a, writing a song or writing a, you know, book or what have you. So, um, yeah, I, I believe in happy accidents. I think that, I think they're, you know, they're things to cherish. They're crucial to the artistic process, it seems. Yeah, sure. Uh, what, what sort of things do you paint? I I do I do things that evoke Cy Twombly. Um, I did a 
I did it. It's funny because I was working with a psychologist to try to get over a lost love. This was maybe 20 years ago. And she said, is there anything you do at all that's just for the love of it, where, where you don't look for recognition and, you know, reviews and things like that? Because she, you know, knew about my books and about the band. And I said, well, gosh, you know, tennis, of course, I'm never going to get on the pro tour. It's way too late. Um, but I said, I've always wanted to paint. And then she said, well, why don't you just go and do that and do that for the sake of its meditative qualities, et cetera. And I did a, a, a collection of um, alternative book covers, which you can find on, you know, on my Facebook page. And um, it turns out that they, those and, and ended up having a show. Like I did, I did M Madame Bovary and the metamorphosis and, um, Catcher in the Rye and Lolita. So, you know, I, I just, I reimagined book covers because I'm obviously such a, you know, a freak, freak for books. Books are my life more than music is even really. So that's what I did. But yeah, it's very, it's, it's, it's highly derivative of Cy Twombly. And I'm, I think I've only bamboozled one person in the last 10 or 15 years into buying, you know, a painting. You know, I think I have another one on the line. So, um, maybe we should just uh, edit out the bit where I say I, I've only sold one one painting, but it was for something like 750 bucks. So, yeah, I was snickering up my sleeve there, that's for sure. But I love doing it. It's, it does take me away from um, obsessing about other things. Like sending you mess <laughs> secret subliminal messages in the songs. I mean, there's only so many I'm going to be able to pick up on. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I get to the point I where could, we're just constantly. I could, I could try to torture you a touch more, Mr. Southpaw, and tell you there are more of them and send you down a veritable rabbit's hole here. So but I won't do that. I love you too much to, to, to tell you to oh. go, go, go far afield in search of uh, messages to you in the songs. But, but you're not going to rule out that there might be more on that. Yeah, I should... there might be one or two more. <laughs> And people should listen to the album because there might be ones for them too, right? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Absolutely. Speaking of secret messages and Nabokov, I reread The Vein Sisters last night. Yeah, um, that's, that's, a, that's a powerful one um, for me. You know, it's in that Nabokov's dozen. Um, so if somebody, you know, chose the best of, you know, the best of um, from him, I think that's, that's, that's the kind of short story along the lines of you know a number of uh, uh, other of, of his um like spring and fialta for instance um or uh, other things you know any given Chekhov story or lots of Catherine mansfield that you could read all throughout your life and many many times and find so much to be um bewildered by and um in awe of and you know, in the presence of uh, of just wondrousness as well. That's it's just. A, uh, did you love it again? Once again, oh, I'm sure it's, totally, it's something you've yeah. read before. Yeah. And you um, notice little things more every time, and it's about those little things, just finding the wonder. And you know, uh, you know, what was glass blown minutia is the line that he ascribes to Cynthia Vale. Um, but yeah, um, it's yeah, it's one of my favorites of his, and one that I just I think you know, okay, let me brace myself when I sit down because I you know Nabokov's my, on my on my top shelf if you look up there you can see you know at, at the very top that he's there and henry james and proust right right below him uh but yes absolutely and i think you know he talked uh um very very sincerely for as sincere as he could be with interviewers about the ways in which he wrote to amuse himself and somebody with such a towering you know and uh um brain uh, uh, I think I, I dare say he would, he, he would have to invent, you know, a certain amount of, of games for his delight. Um, think, thinking solely, you know, as he, he remarked many a time in strong opinions that, you know, he really writes with nobody but himself an ideal reader in mind. That's not to say that it's all solipsistic, although he's been accused of that, but I think that there, you know, he's not alone. Robert Smith has said many a time about Cure songs that when he wants to hear a, a great song without hubris, um, he'd say, I write one. And I can really relate to that because I, I do write both, you know, um, 
songs and stories in or, in order to to please myself and you know do the same thing when I paint something to have something that I really want to look at or you know I'll toss it um, and I I think that's I think again that's an, I'm going to repeat a word here just like William Boyd does rebarbative I think it's disingenuous for anybody to say oh you know or that's the kind of music that I I really don't I really don't admire when it's evident that or acknowledged that somebody goes, yeah, I had a, a listener in mind or, you know, it's just this, it, it finds a parallel in the type of band that would look to an audience to see what's vogue and then try to match their, you know, their product in the true sense of the word to, to that. I mean, maybe this is why our stuff sells in the not thousands you know that that uh, that the niche is just somebody just like me i mean i end up buying my own records sometimes because i always run out of the ones that the label gives me so I, in order to in order to turn somebody on you know or um you know make them happy or uh, wish them happy birthday i end up you know, i was looking at frightfully at Amazon the other day, I uh, know with it's, it's it's we all know it's the devil, but it's a convenient devil sometimes when you want to just ship something without going to the post office. And I I think I I think I bought Brilliant Failures twelve times last year, <laughs> so you know it's just it's it's pretty funny. So yeah, so I am my own oh, audience wow. <laughs> in more ways than one sometimes, and obviously now realizing how sad that sounds but still you you lead me up these garden paths you know i had no idea that was going it's your it's your, it's your inadvertent breadcrumbs that send that send me into the wolf's lair here anyway so what have you been reading lately oh uh, gosh there's this, there's a, there's a, an, again a pyramid uh, you know a pyramid come avalanche of things i'm i'm a, the kind of masochist i don't know if you're like this too that you know i make it a, a part way through a text and i i give up life is too short i've lost the graduate school habit of being bloody bloody mindedly finishing a book so I go back to things going, I've got to make it through a pension novel other than Lot 49, or I've, I've got to do this even though I can't stand this guy, um, uh, Cormac McCarthy. Um, so, you know, I, I love Rachel Cusk. I, I, I just picked up her, her collection of essays um, because I've been blown away by the, uh, I have all of her stuff and I'm madly in love with her. I'm so sorry that she's married. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Not that I have a chance, but Rach, if you're listening and you're unhappy, uh, I'm joking. You should Lo send her a Rachel secret Cuss. message. <laughs> yeah. In your um, and I have, I have a, a close friend, another not-so-secret message. I have a, my closest, oldest, best friend, Brad DeVero, who um, just re just retired after years of working in the Silicon Gulch and who's an absolute brilliant computer scientist who loves literary things as well. Um, I just sent him a biography of uh, Leonardo da Vinci. Um, he's Italian, American, and so he spent a, a quantity of time there and loves art. So sometimes I'll send a friend a book. You give me your address, I'll do that too, or we can just talk because you probably have the book, um, uh, or you can get it. Uh, that you know, and just to read something together. I'm not a joiner. I don't. I would never be in a book club. People have said, "Oh, you're a retired professor." You know, you know, why don't you, why don't you start a book club or something? I go, I would be the worst person to do that because I'd be so bored uh, unless I could control it you know, Socratically. Um, so, but, but a one-on-one -on -one sort of thing, I loved, uh, you know, to a friend going, you know, let's read Wilkie Collins. Let's get into the Moonstone and see, see what we have uh, there. So you and I should do that sometime. We, what I should think, we do? Well, maybe I'll start with the James Bond that you, you recommended. There you go. That seems perfect. Let's do yeah. it. Okay. <laughs> I like this a lot. Brilliant. So the reason I've, I've, I did ask you back, besides all the subliminal messages, is uh, to talk about your new record, which is your second record this year, From Things Some That. Mm -hmm. You want to explain that title? Uh, yeah, it was a Freudian slip. Um, oh, you know, you know, I was thinking, Mr. Young Southpaw, I was thinking that I should pitch to our publicist that I should write 
uh, I should write a review of, of our new record. I should try, I should try to uh, place in a zine somewhere where the artist reviews his own record because uh, even though the reviews from From Thing uh, have, have been glowing of late and there's apparently more coming, so many times people just think that comparisons to other bands suffice rather than an, a description of, of the music. And it's so difficult. It would be a, you know, a task to set myself or anybody. I know you've, uh, or I'm, I'm guessing you've written about music. And I'm sure you have, um, in have. fact. Um, but but and it's not an easy sort of thing to do. But I thought I, I could do a much better job, you know, try to keep it, you know, a, to a modest nine out of 10, rather than a 10 out of 10 you know, in a numerical, from a numerical standpoint. Uh, but, you know, that was a Freudian slip. That'd be the first thing that I'd, you know, elucidate for the listener, um, that I, I was singing something from that, and it came out from things, some that. And we, lo we, as much as, you know, puns are egregious, as the saying goes, um, I thought, you know, so many of our titles have been deeply tongue-in-cheek, like Jiggery po Pokery or Tatterdemalion or Amphetamines that can, you know, contain a lot of slow songs or the gospel according to John um, or Led Zeppelin V. In fact, you know, you tally them in almost all of them. I sing the, I sing the Snow Queen. I sing the Snow Queen. That one, you know, was like very deliberate too. <laughs> you know, I don't like it when, I don't know about you, but I don't like it when people make puns, usually not funny people. You know, you consider yourself a funny guy, um, loves uh, loves funny fiction, and you know maybe you know your listeners might one day discover that an alter ego of yours has written a funny novel or something too. One of these one of these days, who knows? Uh, but um, but I'm I you know that would be telling. I'm not going to tell. But, uh, you know, you, so you appreciate funny stuff, but puns, you know, are, are something of a cop out, but we seem to gravitate towards them. So there's another one of life's little ironies. I don't know. It's just the publicist, again, Robert Vickers, our, our guy for this record has said, you know, gosh, I, I, I do want to tell you that um, I'm thankful because people can Google this one. There are no other records or books called From Things Some that the gospel according to John, however, was a different <laughs> story by biblical and otherwise. So, you know, there you have it. But yeah, I just, I don't know. It just came along and the, the cover, the cover, the picture of the grass tennis court somewhere in England with a beautiful Tudor uh, background has nothing to do it's the usual non sequitur on our on our parts to cover and, and the title has have nothing really to do with the content um therein why because no one can stop me i'm really my own master here um i, I was gonna say you've got two records out this year an ep coming out this is like a 1970s kiss album schedule like where's this volcano yeah. of creativity coming from um, the fact that I retired from being a professor and I don't have an idea for a book and I have a brand new 12 string guitar, electric 12 string and Epiphone Casino. If the Epiphone people are listening, you know, right next to Rachel Cusk, if you're there, you can send me another one, please. Um, just every time I get a new guitar, I manage to, it, it, it whispers a bunch of new songs to me somehow. I mean, I know that sounds trippy, hippy, dippy, but it's it's kind of it's sort of true. So now they they say there's at least one song in every instrument. Yeah, and but you know, then I take it and I tune it down and I capo it up and um, all of the above, and then suddenly I've got ten. Um, you know, the other thing is that I'm blessed beyond blessed, and I hate it when people say, "Oh, I'm so grateful for this yogurt," <laughs> you know, or whatever. But I really am lucky. I have a perpetual shamrock in my pocket um, in having friends uh, and a, who are close associates who have studios, very good studios and great skills. They're not, you know, they're not, they're, they're no greenhorns um, that where occasionally they'll have a, a week of free time and, you know, we hang out and um, have a couple pints and uh, plug in. So. I mean, Los Angeles is still really good, really good for that. There are lots and lots of really talented people. And um, 
I think I've only touched the faders or a button in 30 years, maybe four times. I couldn't, I mean, I, I, I couldn't record myself on a, on a cassette player from 1970 <laughs> somehow, you know, I've never had a four track. I tried to make something on it once. It was just dreadful. I, I'm sure it ended up it ended up flung in the corner. Um, but so that's that's really nice. It's a very symbiotic sort of thing. Uh, just to have have so many close friends who who can record. They record their own stuff or they record bands. So that's yeah. that's that's why. I mean, there's just a you know a, a, a host of great people to work with. Um, and it's a great excuse for us to hang out. I mean, I don't think we've never had a record where it was at all. Um, I mean, it's been it's been arduous before, but it's never not been super enjoyable. It's my favorite place to be. So I get these little budgets and I go and spend them. And then, um, you know, uh, I'm sure I'm sh I'm itching to go in and get and do another one. I think it would be grotesque for me to put out three <laughs> records in one year because I'm kind of getting sick of the Robert Pollard you know, comparisons too. Although somebody did, uh, um, a reviewer d did, you know, secretly, you know, um, you know, in a hush hush way say, you know, your songs are better than Bob Pollard's. I'm going, come on, get out of there. You know, that, that, you know, that's sacrilegious and you're probably trying to wind me up. Um, you know, I mean, I, I could see how he might say that because there's so many of them that how, how does he, he can't possibly keep from having them sound samey when you put out four records in, in a year and you have a certain, you know, style, mind you, I really like Guided by Voices, who, who doesn't? Never met anybody who didn't, didn't like them. Um, but yeah, yeah, so yeah, there'll probably be another one <laughs> coming sometime next year. Yeah, sure, why Excellent. not? No one's I, stopping I, me, <laughs> I'm not stopping myself. But it would be the, tw I don't know, I was reading this, um, uh, uh, an introduction to Swinburne's poems. He, he's another guy that I try to like, you know, he's just so self-indulgent, but, but musical and so over the top. And it's just, they're just word, word, word jumble sales sometimes. But I was reading this introduction to Swinburne and, you know, the, the author said, you know, certainly Swinburne produced too much. And I, I think that there is a danger there to in in history, I mean, if I could be so bold as to put it in those terms, to think of how is your oeuvre going to be, you know, regarded um, if you watered it down by t putting out, you know, too too much stuff. Mm -hmm. And so it may be I'm on the cusp of too much. I'm thinking um, these days that the the next one we do, if if it's done, um, will be the twentieth full length LP, and that might be. As V.S. Nepal counseled some, uh, you know, uh, aspiring and productive um, African novelist when he lived in Africa, he said, "Maybe it's time to stop." <laughs> so it might be time. It might be time to stop. I might have given the world enough music by the next one. You know, I have to try to. I have to try to top. You know, the the jock in me, the guy that plays tennis five days a week. You know. Uh, is I'm I'm only really competitive with myself in that realm. I I only try to play well. I never care if I win. But it, the the competitive person in me might want to try to just do better than I did last time, and um and so, who knows? Plus, you really uh, enjoy making the records, as you. Just oh said. yeah, absolutely. You just if you if you met the people that I that I work with, you'd go, wow, I could see how you'd want to just be here every day. I mean, they're they're always really bright and really funny and um, they know my quirks and, you know, uh, pot potential, you know, peccadillos and work around them really well. I mean, I, I, we really only work with people we worked with before. So there, that's the way it goes. Speaking of tennis, have you ever played a gig on a tennis court? No, <laughs> no, we haven't. We played in a basketball uh, stadium. Um, uh, to to something like, uh, gosh, what was it? Maybe fifteen thousand people. We played a festival in Fresno at the at the, uh, the 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 Fresno State Arena, where we were mismatched with a bunch of um, rap bands and pop bands and that sort of thing. We got a half an hour set to fifteen thousand people that we did because uh, a radio promoter promoter was playing us. Um, so I mean, we were certainly certainly the the freaks as it were that was in the 90s i mean we ju we just did it because 
um, we, we knew we'd sell a bunch of CDs um, to people probably who just bought things to have a souvenir. <laughs> it was in the early days of CDs, so they were still something of a treasure rather than, you know, uh, um, uh, a, a, pyramid, a pyramid of, you know, uselessness in your thrift store. How do you feel playing on a tennis court? Like those two loves of your oh, life gosh, coming together. I don't know. We'll plug in. We're notorious whores. We'll plug in anywhere. <laughs> I mean, it would be it would be fine. I don't know how the sound would do bouncing off the. Uh, it would probably be be um, um, better on uh, on just a hard court rather than clay. Clay might absorb it and make it all you know truly muddy. Pun intended. But yeah, I don't know. You don't could know have like venues. Like your guitar and then another guitarist on the other side of the net like sort of trading there lines. you go yeah of course it would be an excuse for me just to come from the court next door where i'd played because <laughs> i'm such a tennis bum um and and plug in i'm sure people have gigs at country clubs and things like that you know yeah maybe i'll try to get on get us on that on that circuit the, the, the tennis <laughs> a different kind of circuit <laughs> here we are on on the tour I was just reminded like minutes before uh, our interview that uh, my first ever concert was 34 years ago today. Yeah. You know, was... you know, young, I don't enjoy those kinds of references the way that people so very re religiously these days seem to crow, you know, going like uh, not to take anything away from your concert experience when people just go, gosh, it was 51 years ago from, you know, band on the run came out or something or, it's been 327 years since Fleetwood Mac's eponymous one or something like that. Like, gosh, God, you know, my knees remind me of, of the time that's gone by. You don't need to add to that. 34, well, you're still just a kid. Look at you. That's why you're called the Young Southpaw. It was, um, 34 years is a long, it's a lot of shows. It too, is. I'm sure, yeah. yeah uh, think back. I, what was your first show? It was David Lee Roth's first solo tour. Wow. That is you can't take anything a, away from that a, again a mark of you know not oh, not dubious distinction but yeah to have been there the things that you would have seen at that show i'm sure with uh, your your I young guess. southpaw eyes young young south and ears i'm sure he kicked up a fuss too i'm sure good old diamond dave put on one heck of a show one heck of a show steve Vai on guitar billy sheehan on bass they did a dueling Crazy. thing it would have only been better if they were dueling on the tennis court now that I can Where was this? That. The Where Hartford was this? Civic Center. Oh, no kidding. That's crazy. What was your first show? Um, I went to see the Beach Boys with a bunch of friends from prep school. Um, the, that I was uh, um, a, a small circle of friends because, um, not to date myself too terribly, but when I was, uh, you know, in my teen years, the things that I liked, the Beatles and the Beach Boys, were intensely uncool. Really? People were uh, people were over at my at my school was very, very much like a hardcore stoner preppy prep school ex experience. And you know, I was friends with all the long hairs that were deep into Black Oak, Arkansas, and um, JoJo Gunn, whom I liked too, and. Um, you know, Sabbath and ACDC and all the harder stuff, but to, to, to like, to like candy pop like stuff was just, it was, you were, the people would look at you quizzically that, um, uh, so I had a small circle of friends who shared my tastes in a kind of furtive way, but we went to see the Beach Boys um, at the Anaheim Convention Center and, you know, when you go with your mates, it's just, it's un, it's unbelievable. You can't, you, you, you you can't imagine how, I mean, it starts, it starts um, not a lifelong because I'm kind of over live music myself, um, but a, a sort of, you know, a long, a long lived kind of, you know, mania to go, to go and have that whole experience and the anticipation. Maybe I'd go see a concert. I, don't, I certainly don't enjoy going to see bands in clubs anymore. Not that that should prevent any, anybody from seeing the Black Watch, just because I don't go. But I find just the waiting around, uh, you know, the the two the 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 two apparent proximity to people who can come up and tell you your last record was 
a, a, a jangly piece of junk or something. Not that I can't take that if anybody ever has the chutzpah to say such a thing, um, which is fine. I don't care. But, you know, I find that sometimes, especially in L.A., where I've been for a long time, um, you know, I know too many people um, wow. somehow. So that's part, that's part of it. And, I, and, you know, maybe the snob in me just doesn't want to be sub subjected to rock talk. I get sucked into it, as it were, so much. And, you know, I don't know um, how much experience you have in Los Angeles, but there's there's so many uh, old punkers that want to just um, bore you stiff with the times they saw the stiff little fingers or <laughs> the descendants or the adolescents or whatever. And I'm, you know, I was never a punk. I'm a post-punk. But when I, growing up in Santa Barbara, we didn't, you know, they, we didn't have punk, you know, I didn't catch on until 1984 or five or something with, you know, the Smiths and the Cure and Christian Death or whatever. So you know, I don't know anything about punk at all. We were still listening to Jackson Brown and Cat Stevens. We were still a bunch of folkies. Uh, at that my lovely seaside town oh, i want to ask on the new record i'm hearing lots of more 80s english uh pop band influences or some, some i can't quite place so i was wondering we talked about the beatles last time what more stuff from the 80s were you were you into well i mean i'll 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 readily admit that the shadow of the cure has you know, loomed large over us ever since we began with the first one, St. Valentine in 1988. I've tried to mask that um, reverence for Robert Smith and for The Cure. And it took me a long time to shake off a lot of the inflections, but some of them are still there. Some are, are still there in the phrasing. Um, I was, uh, th at that time when I first discovered that and I found the next obsession, just as, as I'd been obsessed, you know, and in college with stuff like Jackson Brown and Cat Stevens and, and Prague too. I was a big Genesis and yes person as well. Oh, absolutely. Wow. Yeah. Um, even the Genesis, you know, like the tributaries of, uh, you know, um, Anthony Phillips, Geese and the Ghost, you know, the, really that pretty 12 stringy stuff. I was a sucker for that, you know, songs about his English history and all that. Um, but, you know, I still listen heavily to, New Order to my bloody Valentine's later 80s stuff. I don't think isn't anything is this the superior record to Loveless. I know that's, you know, Not only true. popular with a certain certain crowd. Um, uh, I, I, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. It's just, it's when, when you play, when I, I was, I was helping a friend in the studio kind of produce a couple songs last night. Um, uh, that he's invented this uh, kind of a jangle goth. My friend Misha Bullock um, has invented a kind of jangle goth thing. I thought, um, you know, I can tell that he writes songs by just pl plucking a couple strings at a time. And I use the full um, right hand strum of chords, you know, usually with uh, strange tunings. Uh, open tunings and you know and with capos so I think that that's kind of the difference if if you I started writing songs when I was 10 and my influences were Simon and Garfunkel so there was picking plucking and you know and strumming and you know the, the uh, would have been Donovan or Dylan or the Beatles or whatever you try to do you know, the Beatles-esque kind of stuff um, so I think that the way in which you play um, kind of dictates slightly how, uh, what genre, you know, things will be. If you're deep into the playing like Roger McGuinn, you're gonna um, write things that evoke the birds uh, um, a little bit or the instrumentation again. But yeah, gosh, I mean, 80s stuff, you know, is the stuff that, that was, you know, contemporary with me starting the band. So um, these would have been the, been the things that I would have absorbed religiously and then, a, a saved to purge equally religiously too because i think that you know any artist worth his or her salt is gonna um go okay i see that i'm really influenced by wallace stevens or sidewombly or whatever the heck it is um better try to hide that um lest you get just pegged as i've always said a band from the 80s 
or 90s, I think maybe, The Ocean Blue. They can't be their own favorite band, as all bands must be, because they're too in love with Echo and the Bunny Man. You know? <laughs> I'm sure you're the nicest guys in the world, Ocean Blue, if you're listening with the Epiphone people and Rachel Cusk <laughs> right now. But, you know, gosh, you, you didn't seem to get over your, you know, obsession with, you know, Ian McCullough, so you got to try to hide that stuff a little bit more. I don't know. Bring in some flugelhorns in a children's choir or something. The old flugelhorn oh. move. Yeah, right. The old flugelhorn move. That'd be weird if, like, they, the Epiphone people and Rachel Cusk were all together listening to this, like, you know, at a house that, party. That would only in a Fellini film there. Mr. That'd South. A, that'd be a good Fellini film. Yeah, that would indeed. I watched Juliet of the Spirits again recently. Wonderful film. Oh, man. Oh, wow. I've never seen it. I highly recommend it. Okay. All right. I'll get on that. Let, let's talk about some of the songs from the album. Okay, sure. Uh, otherwise, I'm just going to be taking notes from you of stuff <laughs> that I've got. I mean, don't you get the sense, isn't there a part of us and all of us who love art so much that there's a kind of a fear that we'll never get to things and that there are films and books and records that are probably tailor-made for you almost that you may never hear or get round to. I mean, I think I'm really oppressed by this. I think it's in some uh, ways in almost a Henry James-like way, if that doesn't sound too terribly pretentious, that it's impinged upon my ability to live you know, just uh, before the lockdown of people going like, don't you want to come to this soiree or whatever? I'm going between you and Dostoevsky. I got, I got to choose old Fyodor. You know, I'm sure I've used that line with you. Probably I've used that line with you, you know, in other times. But it gets to that stage where you go, I'm too terrified that I won't make it through at least one pension book or this Wilkie Collins. I'm, you know, trying to get through. Um, so that's. And somehow that retreat well, into art becomes so all important while at the same time creating your own stuff that's coming through your head all the yeah. time it's, i mean it does make me sick because i ingest so much um stuff in a manner of speaking that it, uh, um, that might be it because my intake is as much as my output um almost um so i think i got, i think i sicken myself you could title this interview with, with I sicken myself I do kind of sicken myself with a surfeit of of things I am the kind of person that would just go um yeah there was a box of eclairs here <laughs> in the morning but now it's afternoon so I do the same thing with books and records and I think it's got to come out it has to come out uh, somewhere where I just go god I can't just devour another thing I've got to I've got to unleash something rather than you know, um, it's just, you know, it's good for you, like eating a salad. <laughs> do you, when you read, do you listen to music at the same time? No, never. I can't do that. No, I know plenty of people possibly. can. It would save so much time, but then you're not giving your attention of what needs no, to be given attention can't to. can't do it. Can't do it. Yeah. No, not at all. Whew. Pickle. <laughs> so we were going to talk about the songs. Okay, go ahead. The Nothing That Is. Probably the most electronic of what's on the new record. Yeah, that's, you know, that's, that, there's where we didn't uh, attempt to mask the influence of New Order. I'm a freak for New Order, the more guitar y things of New Order for sure. And in fact, some, a reviewer just said this is the, this is the best New Order song. Um, and I think it was rather an outrageous um, statement on his part. He said, this is the best New Order song New Order hasn't bothered to write. And I think he was just being clever because, uh, you know, I think that's way too high of praise. Um, I worship New Order and I think they write incredible songs and they haven't given the world enough stuff. Um, but I thought, you know, I'm going to, I had a, I got a disco-y kind of dancey beat because without being a person who, you know, who's, who's keen to go dancing anymore, um, you know, haul out my Mick Jagger imit imitation or whatever. Uh, although I do love to dance and I do, I do, I am suspicious of people who don't dance or don't cook. Um, somehow, yeah, if, if, when, when our Megadon, as we <laughs> anomalously say, it, you know, say it comes down, I want people around me who can dance their way through the apocalypse and who also can make something, you know, I get tired of cooking. 
Um, so would so, you describe yeah, the song yeah. as Mick Jagger fronting New Order? Yeah, Mick Jagger fronting New Order. Sure, why not? Um, uh, you know, I just, I, I thought, let's, let's do something really super dancey. And then we took it to another, uh, 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 to yet another degree by making a dance remix out of it, having, having Scott Campbell and other of our producers do that for the, the follow-up EP. Um, it's called, you know, the Nothing That Is EP. And I'd been reading Wallace Stevens, and that's a quotation from Wallace Stevens, uh, uh, the Nothing That Is. Um, and I thought, you know, again, like so many songs, I have a phrase and I have a, I have a beat and I've got uh, a chord progression on my acoustic. Um, so the next thing is to, to fill it all in and give it some structure. Um, so and then when Rob Campanella and I um, did the recording with his brother Andy on drums, um, we, and we made a little video of the making of that song, too, of how we built it up, um, because so, so often um of late i've just been i've been the band myself rather than um rehearsing um the and then going and going and i find it saves a whole lot of time for me instead of to teach this the song to the band to go and record a lot of it myself and then have them come in and 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 fill in the gaps um but yeah we I mean we loved it we loved it and we kept in a mock sort of way that naive young bands filled with piss and vinegar off and say like, that's a hit, man. We've got a hit on our hands. And the video came out that was done by my old friend, Mike Andreezy, a uh, chap from uh, Minneapolis, um, who did this charming video with these kids and dogs and uh, um, uh, about a quest to find a lost dog. And it flopped. It didn't, it didn't, it, there, there's been maybe 300 hits on the video or something like that. So we had these giant hopes where we'd pump ourselves up thinking, you know, this, this, it'll be so funny to have this song come out, but it sounds like the Black Watch doing their best new order. And this song is going to be huge and blah, blah, blah. And it just, it, that hasn't, that hasn't happened. Not that that really bothers us. We never got into it, you know, for the sake of being um, famous or, or rich or any of the, any of that. But um, it was just, it's funny because we, the, you know, again, goes to show you that, you know, you're not your best um cr critic or admirer too because we just we really thought rob and i got gosh this song is going to be so so big and so many people are going to be made happy by it but you know it's early days the record hasn't hasn't even come out yet um, yeah, you can't judge it if the record's not even out. yeah so but you know singles come out and you get a feel for them and um that that sort of thing so um but again you know i just i just marvel at i, I marvel at um at, at what at the potential for us to do something that's often got left unrealized <laughs> somehow but you know that's but it's quite all right it's not going to stop us um you know but we did the only reason why we'd ever want something to be big quote unquote and to sell would be to get enough money to make um, make another one to supplement the tiny budgets that we have come our way mm. Yeah, but yeah, sure. I mean, I'm, I've listened to it enough and the remix enough that I'm, um, that I'm well and truly sickened, <laughs> but not, not in a, not in a sort of retching sort of way, but, you know, I've heard it, so, I've heard it so much already. And it's one of the reasons why we make records rather than going so much on tour, because I do get tired of the so songs because I play them 427 times before we ever, just by myself, before we ever even go into the studio. So. They're mm. old, old acquaintances at this stage, and they haven't even come out yet. So there you have it. My favorite tune on the record is actually the next one, uh, "The Lonesome Death of Mary Hansen." Oh yeah, I love like major key Thank you. droney riffs like that. Yeah, I like that too. Um, a good friend of mine, Ben Eschbach, who was in a band called The Sugar Plastic. I don't know if you know them. They were on Geffen. They were very XTC mix, meets uh, Talking Heads. And Ben is one of the most cerebral people uh, about music I've ever known. I mean, he, he does film score, scores and string quartets and stuff. He's just an insanely bright guy and really humble and really funny. And uh, The Sugar Plastic is a band that I suggest that everybody check out. Um, he he um, had said, you know, gosh, I, you know, I'm a huge fan of you guys. Um, he loves the, the song, the tennis playing poet Rudka said, 
Um, he, you know, it, it, it had been years since that song came out that he, he told me after years, like, wow, you know, you know, I love that song. It's one of my favorite songs. I go, wow, Ben, you know, it's really gratifying when somebody's work that you admire greatly tells you that's one of their favorite songs. But he said, this has replaced the tennis playing poet as his new favorite song. And in fact, that he who is a total virtuoso, the kind of guy that has fingers that can reach across seven frets. You know, he plays a beautiful mean guitar and I'm, I reckon he's rather bored with pop music maybe. Um, that we went to see uh, um, Not Love and Rock, uh, uh, Bauhaus. Um, him and his girlfriend and I went to see Bauhaus and he goes, you know, uh, when nighttime came, uh, Killing Joke was my favorite band, he said, but nighttime came along and it was just too pop and I gave up on them going, wow, he is a tough one. Ben is a tough one. Um, but he said he was trying to figure it out. A guy who, you know, writes classical music now and has a reach, his hands are uh, insane, a reach across seven frets or so. And he said, John, I can't, can you show me how, how you played that song? Wow. Can wow. you tell me? the tuning and show me and I write so many things and I do them so rapidly that it took me hours to find out what I'd done. Cause you know, there are some, and you know, once you get two guitars that are tuned differently or capo different differently as any sonic youth, you know, uh, idolater will tell you, um, sometimes it is really hard to tell where things come from. So I don't know that I could, I don't know that I could play that song very easily. It would take take a, a you know a minute for me or more to figure it out. But I wanted to pay um, tribute to Mary Hansen, whom I'd met a couple times at Stereo Lab gigs because um, they used to play in Los Angeles and do these kind of secret warm up gigs for their bigger gigs. And they're the nicest people in the world. Um, so I'd met Mary a couple times, and I just thought she added so much to the band on her jazz master and the keys and stuff and she was such a sweetheart and she died so tragically um you know in london being hit by a bike and the song isn't really about her what's once again one of those motifs where the title is a total non sequitur in relation to the song because the gist of the song is about how ludicrous it is for bands to think that they write l lyrics that are poetry because lyrics are lyrics for me and poetry is poetry i've been very outspoken about saying i love dylan but what he does is not literature maybe you know maybe the tarantula text but those are those are lyrics they're not poems um he shouldn't have won the nobel for literature i have almost all of the records i love bob dylan don't get me wrong but lyrics are not in fact an old professor of mine was you know a great supporter when i went back up to santa barbara he said you know john that your lyrics are poems and you know, I'm going you are the most brilliant prof I've ever ha said but had but that is nonsense it's utter twaddle I know I know people who know should know it's like that Alexander Pope thing about you let those criticize who've written well you know somehow that um and so it's it sort of kind of thing about um because I don't know you live in Los Angeles and you see a bunch of bands get um a lot of um, write-ups and attention and what they you know a lot of times what they're writing is just drivel and i don't i don't care about lyrics unless they're terrible one of my favorite bands are you know, uh, among them are the cocteau twins and my bloody valentine and you can't you can't tell what they're saying at all because they don't they don't matter political rock doesn't appeal to me one bit to go sloganeering through three minutes to take a really you know um, convoluted, you know, beyond complex problem, um, uh, like uh, like any given political thing, and try to treat it in in uh, you know in three minutes is is preposterous. It seems. You posted about the Clash yesterday, though. Yeah, I love the Clash. Sure, I mean, again, I'm not listening to what they say. <laughs> beyond, <laughs> I'm so bored with the USA, which we've all got to be, you know, bored with the USA and our ineptitude, our collective ineptitude, and you know, congressional ineptitude. So, if Congress, if you're listening with Rachel Cuss, ep Epiphone, and the Ocean Blue, please send us our next stimulus check. You know, here I'm here to testify testify johnny uh, that you know we all need another 12 uh, measly 1200 bucks I, I have a lot of friends who do 
do quite well for themselves. I've always hated that expression, like only for yourself, not for others. Um, they've done quite well. We're going, ah, oh, 1200 bucks. What good is that going to do me? I'm going, shove it over my way. If I'll accept, uh, you know, your, your, you endorse it over because I could use the $1,200 myself. But yeah, you know, I'm listening to melodies. I'm a melody guy. I'm, you know. I learned to write songs by worshiping the Beatles and worshiping in church and being forced to sing hymns. That's me. All right, what's what's the next one? The Lonesome Death of Mary, Mary Hansen. Cause you know, that title, uh, uh, you know, evokes Dylan from, you know, Hattie Carroll. That's, that was okay. another part too. So there's, but that was another message to you that you missed. Oh, I got to get on this. Pay more getting enough caffeine because get some more ingested in your brain, young, so you can catch all these messages. I was trying to talk to you through Dylan and Mary Hansen. Oh, man, I, I'm sorry. It's okay. <laughs> it's okay. I'll pay I more attention you. There'll next time you send me a message. Record. Yeah. Uh, such like friendly demons. It's got this really relaxed, like long-held notes feel. Vocals a bit like late 60s, early 70s psychedelia, I thought. thought. Well, that might be Rob's doing in part, um, coaching me um, in terms of the, the doing the vocal performance. He certainly asks me to do way, way, way a lot of takes and then cobbles the best ones together. Um, so uh, I, I just thought, um, as we always do, I mean, I'm, I've said it many a time that I try to make the, the wide album every time we go into the studio and I fail. Um, but to have a song that was very languorous, like long, 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 um, or good night, good night, uh, you know, was a necessary thing to break up, you know, the shimmery pop things and skip along jangle, jangle pop or the very, uh, you know, deeply, uh dream poppy shoegaze um kind of stuff um it was just nice to do a more lugubrious thing before the even more lugubrious you know record ender um so i don't i don't know it just seems like again that that's that that it might be con conceived of a uh, sort of genre hop but it's natural for me to as a as a jolly melancholy person to do to do something that again tone paints or evokes you know a, a, a very dour kind of sensibility and you know and that's a song about embracing your embracing the demons that are also muses um that that it's a crime or a sin for for you one not to do things i mean uh i i know so many blocked people who can't seem to finish things who have half a record written or a novel in a drawer that's a first draft or they give up after um 300 pages or something and I, I think it's like a lot of our songs you know all kidding aside that they're meant to encourage other people um you know do really well for yourself in an artistic way follow through and see what you see what you can do don't be afraid if you have you're lucky to have a muse or artistic demons embrace them invite them in for a cuppa you know that's that's my take on on that too um because i spent so long being a a professor which was you know the for the most part it's tantamount to being kind of a coach to go come on you can do better you can do better i can't write your paper for you and I have such a sports background as well, where I've been yelled at slash encouraged by so many, you know, coaches for the various teams that I've been on and that I quit, you know. Um, so, you know, I've been, a, I'm, it's so funny, it's quasi hypocritical to think I'm a, I'm a serious quitter. I quit being married, I quit smoking, I quit working, I quit trying, you know, on so many levels. But I do feel as though in last night and working with my friend Misha stuff that it was my role to just go, uh, you know, I can't quit encouraging people to continue to, you know, especially talented people. You've got to combat the non-talented ones. I'm surrounded by them. There's so many here in Los Angeles who people have bands and put out records and they're just rubbish. You know, there's no point for them to be a band 
uh, at, at all or to produce things. And the same thing goes for poets. And then there's people with vast talent and, and some ambition who are discouraged and dismayed by their own ability to finish things and also probably you know, terrified somehow. And then they need, I could tell last night, Misha, who's an insanely talented drummer and singer and guitar player, you know, that, that who's, who's not put out a record, but just joined other people's bands and is really, you know, determined to do this. He, he just needed somebody to say, stop the voices that are telling you you're not good. Uh, and quit listening to them and listen to me who knows, I know, you know, I know best. Um, uh, here, I, I wouldn't kid you on, what you have is really good, let's find out how good it can be, let's turn it into an adventure and a kind of a wonderland, let's go. So that's, I mean, that's really kind of my role, and really when it comes down to all of the songs are meant as consolations, not just to myself, but, you know, to others, because myself is others. <laughs> Do you ever have a problem finishing things yourself? Do you have any tricks? No, not at all. Never. Because art is sort of like magic in that way, is when you do complete it, it opens up this whole other world for you just through the process of finishing. I was talking about this it, it, with someone. Yeah, I think, that's, I think that's very true. And also, if you're only out to please yourself, you can stop when you've done that you know somehow if it's the people i know and there are a couple of very people you know close people in my life one of whom um i i won't i won't name because you know i'm his biggest supporter um but he he just and like lots of really talented people who don't who don't believe you're telling them like no you're really good you're just saying that and they deflect the the compliment i think it 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 finds a parallel in psychology in the sense that we have to learn to take compliments better. And I was thinking about this of late too, that when somebody tells you, wow, that's a really nice book you've written or that's a really good song, just say thank you. They didn't have to say that. They mm -hmm. went out of their way to point this out, do homage to the fact that they didn't have to compliment you rather than deflecting it as so many of us do. And I used to do all the time of going, oh, you don't mean that. Um, oh, you're just saying that. Oh no, it's not that good. I mean, that that's a that's a, a you know a a minor um, insult deflection of their of their of their especially if it's sincere and they're not just you know it's not just sheer flummery. Um, but you should all you should learn to take a compliment on the chin. I I, I truly believe, um, and I I think it just it does the world a power of good to be able to to be able to do that and also to encourage people who, who, who need it, who perhaps think too much about how this might sound, you know, like Lush or Sonic Youth or whatever, to get those voices straight because they're perilous. They, get, they prevent you from, uh, from achieving something and then it's a vicious circle of self-loathing and then that turns to other loathing. And that's not how we'll have peace on earth and goodwill towards men and women and artists who are neither men nor women but monsters <laughs> as we all know there's a reason why mummy told you not to date musicians or novelists or anything like that because they are monsters so there you go but to encourage them to continue to make those things that make life worth living if you ask me and you did <laughs> woe did. betide you <laughs> young south pop woe betide you etc <laughs> et <cetera. laughs> that is, you know the people we need to fill our lives with more with more good things to try to push the bad things away like having a salad after you've chomped down on an entire box of chocolate eclair Excellent. Well, I think this is a good place to end it. Thank you so much for oh, coming brilliant. on the show. Thank you, you anything very else much. You want to add? It's been an honor and a pleasure. We do. Excellent. Yeah. And